Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so tonight we'll be hearing from Alona Gaynor. Alona Gaynor's work investigates the structural and material dimensions of capital and is rooted in seeking to apply languages and form to non-visual experiences across a range of media, including films, texts, drawings, theater, and installations. Her work has been disseminated internationally through exhibitions, workshops, lectures, and publications, most notably the Design Museum in London, STUK and Leuven, FACT in Liverpool, the Lisbon Architecture Triennale in Portugal, the Luther Elephant Gallery in Berlin, the Biennale International Design Saint Etienne, France, and the HMKV in Dortmund. She also serves as a juror and teaches across design, fine art and architecture, and is currently an assistant professor in designed objects at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Everyone, please take me, uh, help me in welcoming Elena Gaynor. Thank you. So I'm going to just uh, share my screen for a moment. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so I'll begin by saying that, so I am a designer, I'm also an artist, but those change depending on who's paying uh, often. And that is um, sometimes an interesting way to maneuver between, oh, is my doc sharing? Hang on one second, there we go. Um, an interesting way to maneuver between um, how one gets funding and the kinds of dissemination and ways, all the conversations that can be had. So I divide my practice between design art, which is exhibition work and research, which is critical writing and consultancy. And my work both divided, <coughs> commissioned and self-directed sits on the border between design, art and architecture. Excuse me. <coughs> and over the years, the idea of the, oh, so over the, over the years, the idea of the plot has become my role as the, of the designer, taking form of narrative schemes, objects, writing and film as ways to explore, <coughs> excuse me, um, my voice is, can I run and get some water? One second, I'll be back in two seconds. <clears throat> My apologies, there's been all sorts of emergencies going on today. So start again. Over the years, the idea of the plot has become my role as a designer, taking form as narrative schemes, objects, writing and films, as ways to explore contemporary developments in politics, economics, technology and law. And as a designer, I've often asked, and as I, might, as I imagine architects do too, what does geometry actually do? And what are the ways in which design fiction, and fiction can intersect with other fields? <clears throat> and how it can not only offer a point of transit between them, but a conceptual and material framework for which design can offer a means of perspective, being able to grasp at the environment in ways that enable us to act upon it. And I've often done this through looking at specific themes, so law, politics, economics, technology, and popular culture, because I believe all of them are interconnected. And I'm firstly interested in plots, which I mean in the fullest sense of the word. And it first got picked up by artisan, artisans and surveyors in their workshops where plotting came to mean the marking out of space, which is to say a plot of ground and then taken into the theater, where it came to mean the arrangement of people in things in space over time. And that's where it's got its last narrative sense. And by the 1600s, it came to mean a conspiratorial activity as in the plot against the king, the gunpowder plot and so on, originating in the sort of historiographic look at um, the toppling of governments across England. 
that came to mean some or imply some offstage directorial presence that was un, un organizing things unbeknown to the people enacting in the plot. This is often broken down by this idea of plots, cunning, traps, and all that encompasses in this idea of metis. So my interest has often been in the precision <coughs> that allow material forces to collide in the form of planning. So a spatial awareness, anticipation, and plotting that could almost be described as fetishistic. Often my work has been critiqued as being somewhat fetishistic. In a slow imagined device without the climax of realization and how this horizon of de design not only invites a precise quality of design, but not afforded by any given system or strategy, but how this aesthetic is at work when stratagems, objects and language are given forth and force and exact agency through their placement and timely action. So if we think about a trap, for example, as in the object, my favorite of all the objects, links narratives to both space and to cunning. And design has a long history of being associated with traps because it's the same kind of intelligence that goes into making a trap as to making other things. So you carefully gauge the behavior of the prey, its habits and the way it acts in particular situations, and then you manipulating it using this knowledge of observance. And in this situation, the precision with which a single spatial intervention with an object is made and can turn our world on its head, creating, undoing, or transforming as a whole. And in this situation, the mouse, which is not unlike design, it's certainly not unlike architecture. So the preoccupations of the following works do not belong to the object per se. In fact, on the contrary, sometimes I find objects a little bit boring when they're when they're singular, when they're singularly in a gallery. Um, but a, a cataclysm of operation, a stacked, layered, aligned and misaligned, fine thread of deviation, which is a phrase that belongs to the workers' rights activist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, characterized as the saboteur working within the factory, in which one thread purposefully misplaced on the loom would destroy a full day's production. And as Flynn would describe this as putting vinegar on the loom, doubt in a smile, glass in the motor, milk in the bearings, shit on the spikes, sand in the soup, and worms in the code. And the acts of which business as usual or the sleight of hand in this situation can present identical properties, both which can be mistaken or seen as the same, or, or mistakenly seen as the same entropic outcome of the same orderly mischance, i.e., business as usual. Unlike Flynn, however, the aim of this work is not for a means of emancipation, although perhaps from the designed object itself, but instead aims to form a somewhat dispassionate vocabulary that is, of course, reflexive, but in doing so, start to unravel our mutable disentanglement with fiction as a tool for discernment, control, disruption, and ultimately disobedience. So many cultures have come to the conclusion that designers are not to be trusted, which I'm very much in favor of such. And the ancient Greeks had a dedicated term for it, metis, and for this dimension of design, which is implied where extraordinary effects are elicited from uncompromising materials, links the construction of artifacts with daring military stratagems, programs of seduction, insidious courtly intrigues, and even the ability of foxes and rats to evade capture and control. And in this same register, I've always referred to this as using craft to be crafty, which is what I consider design to be, meaning that is, it is the contortion of materials, wisdom and cunning intelligence that the coordination of things and people and objects move around in time and space. And this is the only way that design is able to prospect beyond the potential of one and offer a truly complex underpinning. Likewise, in, 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 in spatial and architectural design, even if suspended or prototyped in fiction, which my work is often um, a means to do so. So the following projects do not aspire to conjure some sort of image of utopia in, in hopes of citing a future towards it or any kind of um, 
politicization of design that has been adopted by speculative design, or perhaps, shall I say, the lack of politicization that speculative design brings along with it. Or for that matter, it posit a dystopia to be evaded. Instead, it pursues an examination of the mechanisms of risk assessment, financial calculation, and rather more literal legal forms of judgment. So I'm going to start by, I'm going to, uh, sort of in the rest of this talk, go over two distinct projects and then briefly mention a work that I'm working on right now, which has been a sort of year in the making, but is still going. Um, and this was a graduate project when I graduated from the Royal College of Art. Um, I studied in design interactions under the designers Dunn and Raby uh, in 2011. So it reverse, the goal of the project is called Everything Ends in Chaos. And it was to reverse engineer a fictive global financial catastrophe. And one might ask, well, how it, these happen all the time. And of course, someone's job is to trace the intricate trajectories of these things, but perhaps it's not, surprisingly. So the project's look or pretext was to trace the intricate trajectories of people and things implicated in the unfolding disaster in ways that are cinematic, but the narrative film often would disallow. So it's presented as an index narrative proposal modeling this financial catastrophe. And it centers around the coordinated and allied countermeasures of the kidnapping of a wealthy woman, aiming to pursue the, the examination of the mechanisms of risk assessment and financial calculation as a material force for design. So the objects you see form a war room table mapping to calculate in detail the various actuary financial implications brought upon these various systems to coincide with the violence and misery bestowed upon the kidnapped woman. So accumulating, offsetting and highlighting as much financial profit for the players involved on those who are, whom are implicated. And the objects on the table were, des were designed, they're 3D print printed and flocked in a kind of like gray fur and the sort of, the tone of gray was chosen in reference to the kinds of gray you'd find on printers, these sort of old IBM printers, but designed to be soft like the sorts of objects imagined in comp company boardrooms and mounted on steel rods. So the project's plot begins with the kidnapping of the wealthy wife of the Senator, Mrs. Henderson. And what people often don't know about this project um, is that not only is Mrs. Henderson an important figure within this story, but a desirable figure to some, yet disposable commodity to others. Of course, women in every narrative, in most narrative representations are disposable and yet desirable. And that is the sort of um, often the dichotomy um, within film, within large narratives, particularly within kidnap and ransom stories, especially relating to sort of financial structures. What people don't know about this project particularly, and I will talk a little bit more about the research, was that I had a real woman followed in Arizona when I was a student at the Rural College of Art. I hired a private investigator and spent some of the money that was meant to be for my tuition fees on following this woman. And I found her through the Forbes Rich List. She was the wife of a senator. Of course, by no means, and just to clarify, she was not harmed. Um, she was not privy to being followed and I won't reveal her name, but it was simply a way for me to understand how a person or biological object, shall we say, is broken down into economic factors. So discussing this from a financial perspective, but also looking at, was she worth something to someone? How could that be broken down? Did she have children? Did she have pets, et cetera, et cetera. So working with bankers, brokers, loss adjusters, and risk strategists through the course of the project, the scenarios depicted across the table were passed through actuary financial assessment as to their probabilities and financial implications and investigates the point at which economic and spatial fact collide with speculation. So while this, uh, while this project essentially offers up a spectacle of misdeeds, which is essentially what you'd see mapped across the table, a series of collisions, 
It uses abstract stratagems that navigate a series of accumulated grifts that eventually lead to a collapse designed to make visible the legal and financial countermeasures set forth as a legitimate Byzantine of technical feed. It's a very, very technical project and was the only goal or way of moving forward as, a, as an attempt to foreground risk of precise action in asking what is gambled in the narrowing margins of space and time where exactness matters and becomes a force in its own right, for itself becomes something different when intensified to this point where visceral situations are coupled with an unflinching detachment that their complexity requires. An acumen literally sharpness became the deciding vector, financial sharpness, risk sharpness, how, how algorithms are based on calculating the insurance probabilities of such a catastrophe. So, so this took place as the form of insurance assessments to the value of individual body parts. So for example, in Mrs. Henderson, her breasts and her fingers being the most commodified and iconic uh, pieces of a woman, particularly a woman who is married, to the specific location of people, objects, and language, their devices and their geographical and hierarchical relationship to one another. So, I mean, the, the important thing to sort of note within this is that in this precision as a quality of design, it's not afforded by any given system or technology, but how an aesthetic is at work when stratagems are given force and exact placement through timely action. Sing situations which a single spatial intervention can be made to turn on its head, creating, undoing, or transforming as a whole. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the research in this project because a lot of it required research and I'll, I can talk a little bit more about how um, I went through various financial assessments um, in a moment but essentially I read a book called Trading for Dummies which is a basic Wiley have produced lots of these books for various things but also hedge funds for dummies and I took I did a um, an internship at Merrill Lynch in New York in the summer between my first and second year at the Royal College of Art. And I lied on my CV when applying and said that I was interested in working for hedge funds long term and that I had graduated with an economics degree, of course, total bullshit, but interested in seeing how far I could drag this out through trying to persuade someone to allow me into their offices and to allow me to look at the sort of cultural ways in which people behave in such situations. At, the, at, the, at this point, I had no idea what the project was really about, was merely exploring. And of course, when I got to the interview, due to visa issues and sort of a, um, a steady conscience, really revealing what I was interested in doing. Look, I'm an artist, I'm interested in doing this, and I'm studying this research in relationship to design etc etc can I come and work for you and I did for a brief period of time but a much more low-key internship than what was originally pitched forward to them and my research took me into various places I, I attended an insurance conference uh, in London and those that know their history of insurance which I'm sure is nobody because it's considered a big snore but um, insurance was invented in England in the 1600s um, and Lloyd's of London is one of the biggest standing uh, insurance conglomerates that are um, in that exist within the world, including Hiscox, etc. But I was in a um, there was a, a period of the conference that spoke about kidnap and ransom insurance and I was never it's always fascinating to me because of the cinematic potential of such and, and being a huge fan of the Cohen brothers and so on. But, you know, Sam Evans, who was um, a loss adjuster at BPL, who actually now ensures um, the price of heating oil across um, borders that are unstable, across countries that are unstable. He says, you know, occasionally a severed finger will land on your desk delivered via FedEx, which is interesting because actually I did a lot of research into this very statement. I sort of sat up in my chair 
And then for weeks and weeks after learning that you can only get a digit delivered via FedEx digit, meaning an appendage or finger, breast, et cetera, delivered via FedEx. And it's the only delivery company that's reinsured to pay out um, a ransom demand if the delivery isn't met. You couldn't send it via UPS because they're not insured for such things, but FedEx ironically are. And this really fascinates me because of, you know, being a fan and perhaps being a little obsessed with the Cohen brothers is to really understand this system of exchange and imagine whether did cinema or narrative or literature come first in relationship to sort of kidnapping etiquette, which if you don't know is that an appendage is cut off or there is a message sent, but often an appendage is more likely to get the intention of your loss, bro, uh, uh, your underwriter's attention, which is essentially um, someone that underwrites the contract in relationship to insurance. And that a digit is sent, often a wedding, you know, a ring finger so that the DNA could be tested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, very un, it's very rare that it's something beyond that, but it is an incredibly normal, normal, quote unquote, normal thing to do in the financial exchange of kidnap and ransom in that um, appendages are sent as such. So I, I was for the longest time trying to figure out how these strategies worked and, and who invented it and so on. But if you look at the sort of basic um, charts that you would find in any um, accident and dismemberment policy or kidnap and ransom insurance policy, you're likely to see something such as this. So this first one, documenting how much appendages are worth. So, you know, hands and feet, 250,000. And this is if you went on an ordinary work trip, et cetera, et cetera. And of course the premium goes up or down depending on the mitigated risk of danger. Are you going into a dangerous situation? This is more fascinating, however. So this is put in most of kidnap and ransom brochures as a way to convince those that are looking to buy insurance to pay out or pay through premiums for it, because this is the probability or the eventuality of things turning out in these various ways. So ransom paid 67%, rescued a measly 7%, killed 9%, which I actually thought was surprisingly low, but perhaps I watched too much cinema release no payment and then the mysterious two percent which is other which i did months of research trying to figure out what that other was and sort of concluded that perhaps stockholm syndrome um which often isn't high enough to be added into precise statistics there's also a really kind of beautiful acute vernacular of which i'm interested and it's it sits somewhere between these two worlds of thought in that if we look at in terms of the law, for example, and in finance, especially within insurance fictions, they're often, fiction is often used to serve as intermediaries between their functions and its application. And for example, the very foundation of legal practice makes use of semiotic maneuverability of some intricacies, of some intricacy, sorry, to conceal of its lack of autonomy. And we could also say the same thing about design. And that fiction serves as artifice and instruments of thought that A, contradict reality, B, are under, generally understood to do so, and C, are used to achieve a goal indirectly where the direct route is somehow not viable. And I'm interested in these same ideas and notions for design. When we talk about the suspension of disbelief, for example, if you talk about speculative fiction or the memetics of fine art. But there's something quite beautiful in these two covers. So these are the brochure covers from 2008, 2009 of Hiscox, which is one of the biggest um, insurance companies that deal with crises. And more interestingly enough, a virus spreading panic, which was on the cover of the 2009, but more beautifully so, a pool that won't hold its water. So accompanying the table was a series of films depicting three pivotal moments within the scenario. 
and I can't show, they, these are shot in slow motion, but I've, I've tried to show films across Zoom before and they often don't work too well, but these are some of the stills from the films. And the films were used to accompany the table works to show the moments at which these moments of financial calculation become a visible spectacle. And I often start with an image and work backwards. What is the spectacle I'm hoping to achieve? And what is the, the sort of forensic research that can lead to this single yield of an image? But just to sort of conclude on this project, the way that the work was calculated um, with the various actuaries is that I presented in a room full of insurance brokers, loss adjusters, um, a scenario that I've written over and over again under their advisory and asked them to calculate as many losses and gains financially as possible based on the things that I would do to this woman and to the various um, uh, brokers that related to her life um, and desires of such. Um, and then going into the next project, um, which will be the second out of the two is Under Black Carpets. So this project was conducted between 2011 and 2013 not because I wanted to do the project that long, it just sort of got drawn out um, over delays and exhibitions and, and talks and sort of uh, further writings of such. And it's a project that attempts to take a closer look again at the US legal system through the design and deconstruction of a bank heist. This work took roughly eight months of research and a team of people. And there's something to note in that many contemporary technologies lend themselves to de the deconstruction of events and there's a, the majority of my work looks at events and the deconstruction and reconstruction of such and i can talk a little bit about that at the end but ones that can be de deployed before a jury to argue fact and intent when we talk about forensic technologies so found footage microscopy ballistics diagrams dna swabs and so on sorts of images that you see that are over embellished in Hollywood, particularly programs like CSI, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly to this aesthetic production is that these technologies lend themselves not only to forensics, but, but a portfolio of diagnostic means and as, and it, as an a substantial aesthetic force. And the intent and original pretext of this project was initially to plan to design and rob five banks in downtown LA. In what started off as a pursuit to undermine cinema as a kind of architectural study, but turned into a much larger project positioning crime as the symmetry of design. If you think about perhaps architects and detectives are simply not really any different than criminals or that the, in this case, bank robbers, they simply find themselves on the right side of the law. If you think about architects, for example, they construct, design and construct a space, an exterior and interior, and someone that's trying to rob it, their only job is to, again, deconstruct that space. So it's sort of reverse engineering almost. And I wanted to see what would happen in reality when these two sides collide. So whilst looking at these banks in downtown LA, so these are the targeted ones, so it's Bank of America, Mellon Bank, US Bank, Wells Fargo, and I, I can never remember what the ladder logo is, it made ever, never made any sense as to which bank it was, but it, they're all located within a five mile radius in downtown Los Angeles. And I picked Los Angeles not only because of its um, cinematic history as a city, but it's also the most robbed city in the world. And based on its sort of urban landscape in that it's easily escapable via highways or air traffic, but not only that, um, the, the way that the banks are constructed with their flat roofs, et cetera, um, in buildings that are constructed for a much warmer climate are much easily uh, able to be penetrated than those that are constructed in a colder climate or for a colder climate. For example, um, in Alaska, no one has ever attempted to rob a bank, maybe because they couldn't be bothered enough because it's so cold, but 
often enough it's very very difficult to do so with such with the flora and fauna and cold weather that they would be confronted with and while looking at police crime forensics architecture etc in los angeles i visited a few times the lapd and then more than a few times in east hollywood so i came across the police academy and the reason for the sort of natural progression in research in this project to come across the police academy was to, of course, look at how police, how on earth would police respond as a countermeasure to a robbery taking place in LA? Because the only way that we can speculate is if either we had taken place in a robbery and we'd robbed something before, or through cinema, which neither are really accurate and they're just purely speculation. So I visited the LAPD in East Hollywood more to get be, to become friendly with the officers that would be training there. And sort of a little bit about research techniques or the ways that I go about these sort of long standing projects is that I often meet people along the way who become sort of interesting fellows that allow me to have a much larger more in-depth discussion of these institutions that i've often um, commandeered or entered or had dis had conversations with this is a guy named dave i can't reveal his surname but he he he's worked on the security at the police academy for 20 years when i had visited him back in 2012 and i got talking to him about various things but mainly about what how how the police academy works how does one train to be a police officer and there's this book the only book that you can buy um at the police academy and it's called so you want to be a cop what it takes to serve by scott butler a comedic perhaps piece of literature but strangely not at the same time it's a very very difficult book to swallow um there's a chapter in it, there's a there's the chapter seven is called the mythology of donuts but it also talks a lot about the politics and social uh, mores that required to be an officer and how do you explain to your family that you would like to become a police officer of course no not ironic given how racist the lapd is but more interestingly enough, my time at the police academy, which grew out of more and more conversations um, with the police chief, so just having a tour, um, presenting myself as, a, a, of course, as an artist wanting to look around and wanting to tour and wanting to speak to officers, not about anything in detail, but more sort of um, the culture of the place, the sort of social construct of how officers talk to one another, et cetera, et cetera. But over time began to talk more and more to officers that would come back from a job and start comparing incidents to filmic scenes, which, as you can imagine, is a very problematic way to talk about specific issues within the law. Um, and that it struck me that the project was perhaps wasn't as straightforward as it should have been, as you can imagine, comparing uh, say, for example, a homicide, not that I got any details, but starting a sentence such as it was like in that movie, dot, dot, dot. This becomes incredibly problematic, as you can imagine, as an officer writing a report and citing a film in the retelling of such an incident to be incredibly problematic. And so my time at the LAPD completely transformed the project. And I was inside the LAPD for three days a week for seven weeks in total. So it's quite a long time. And there were opportunities to sit in classes. Um, I had special insurance that would cover my time there. So looking at how, for example, to fire weaponry, et cetera, et cetera. But the work changed and then it became about designing the most perfectly cinematic but accurate robbery, but not for the purposes of an architectural spectacle, but a spectacle for the jury that would be implicated in asking to prosecute the accused in such a case using police testimony and evidence in court. I also um, sought to track down, I'd read a book, um, I'd read a book by Special Agent Brenda Cotton at the time, who 
was the um, the head of the highest department at the FBI. This is the building in New York, but began speaking more and more to her about not necessarily her experiences because because her experiences were documented um, in a particular journal she was writing for at the time. But looking at how the sort of larger larger constructs of how heist exist in the eyes of the Bureau and what is done to um, systemically to combat such a thing through urban planning, et cetera, et cetera. There's not enough time to go into all of the research for that today. But the point is that in the courtroom, it's a place where exactness translates into plausibility, which in turn is the currency of persuasion, which is to say that no matter what the facts of the case, Precision produces legal agency through the suspension of disbelief. And that precision in this case, referring to the very design of the objects that were designed to be wheeled into court. And let me explain a little bit about what that is. And so the finalized objects were a series of architectural models and architectural modeling details presented as detailed plans in this fictional event, which is the simultaneous robbery of five banks in the area that surround one Wilshire in downtown LA, a building with huge significance. But again, I don't have much time to go into that. Um, those that wanna know more, I would recommend reading the book Blue Monday, which talks about one Wilshire. Essentially it's, a, it's the, one of the largest terrorist targets in America because it serves as a server data bank across several of its floors. The buildings that surround One Wilshire are predominantly uh, unoccupied due to the security measures that are required to keep this building um, in its grasp, uh, uh, building in its security needs in its grasp. So important in the object's design was the need to be presented in court, and this is the way in which the voice of the work and the exhibition would be presented. So in this case, the objects from alibi reconstructions through trajectory diagrams are evidence that's not recovered from the scene of a crime, but created for the express purposes of activating a conclusive legal discussion. So at the time of this work, so 2012, designers and architects, and I think this is still going on now, but the law shifted and changed in 2012. Designers and architects were being employed by attorneys to essentially construct evidence. That's not to say construct evidence that could be considered as fact, but evidence that becomes, um, as you can imagine, highly problematic and that we know that objects are highly po politicized within their very design and evidence that is essentially presented in court as a way to justify an argument through the geometric possibilities of these objects and the spaces of speculation that the lawyers are making. So not only is that maybe not necessarily an issue because one would do that um, in often crime cases, you know, you'd see um, plan sections of buildings that had been um, drawn out, mapping out murders, rapes, etc., and the objects that were that were in the various rooms or spaces at the time. But what this, what this comes, or sorry, the, the, the challenges that come with this, for example, is that we know objects aren't lacking in politics in that, for example, or I talking to two attorneys at the time during the, the time at which I was doing the research for this, for example, an attorney might choose to hire an architecture firm who might choose to make um, the objects that they make in a quote unquote uh, inexpensive material, which of course one would never make uh, a model, particularly a prototype of such diagrammatic nature in anything but cardboard. But if you take and put that architectural model in front of a jury that's made of cardboard, the suggestion is that the attorneys haven't spent enough, ev enough money on constructing the evidence that they may feel that they might not win and therefore don't want to put enough um, it, uh, sorry, um, there's, there's like, I have a balcony here and there's just 
suddenly an eagle just landed on my balcony, which is really bizarre. Um, they might not they might not put enough um, funds into defending the case. And for example, um, architects and designers putting too much emphasis in the material construction, say, for example, not that anyone would ever do this, but say they constructed something out of marble equally. So there's no way that they would win that that kind of politicized way of looking at material construction would fly in front of a jury, assuming they're putting all of their energy into the construction of this evidence and therefore they have something to hide. And this particular design or this particular um, construction of downtown LA was designed to look like the black glass um, text cutouts in the lobbies of high rises that you'd see indexing uh, which companies and individuals were listed floor by floor. So the suggestive narrative is flawed, overcompensated, lacking in distinguishable truth and linearity. Is, it is purposefully curated with the intention to seem overly fragmented, confusing and complex. Much like that of a police investigation, the answer is still cloudy and unclear, but with hope for resolution. And as such, this work does not seek to produce a definitive map of the events that occurred, but something that looks beyond reasonable doubt, plugging gaps and estimating probabilities and speak, speaking to the vernacular of materials that might be viewed inside a courtroom. And these are sort of the studies of entrances and exits that um, I took outside of the bank with several assistants. Um, precision serves both sides here. The intricate trajectories used in the robberies to gain access to vaults and make good on the getaway and the authorities' efforts to produce a retrospective picture of events that were persuasive enough for a sentence to be passed, even if false. So something, the, the, the curatorial voice of this work, and these, these various details that accompanied the model were indexed and numbered. Um, so these are, the, for example, the groups and characters were, were um, dissected into groups and sections that play to how juries imagine and examine, say, for example, race, gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, that would make up either witnesses or um, a voir dire selection, which is essentially the art of selecting a jury. So the curatorial voice of the work was not only to recount the plot of the robbery, although the plot is mediated through one's own interpretation of the exhibits, but to also show a retrospective picture of how police would break down the evidence as such. And so this project has an, another, several other lives in that it was bought by Sam Raimi, the film director's company, in hopes that they might one day make a heist movie out of this. Um, and they're still, I think they're still paying licensing on such a thing, but this is also used across, um, classes that look at mock trials and voir dire selections. So this has been often tested twice and is about to go through its third iteration of objects that would appear in court. So it's gone through various mock trials at Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. And then just to finish another three minutes on um, looking at this project briefly that I'm currently writing um, is, uh, Godzilla is being presented as a political study. So it's called the Untangling of, Ta Untangling of a Gorilla Whale. And that is a parafiction research novel aimed to understand the roles, risk, political and economic agendas and strategies at dealing with disaster. So it looks at Godzilla as a legal object, but more precisely an object in motion and this volume aims to shift between legal fact and fiction and will be constructed through a series of legal arguments and propositions compromising of interviews with politicians, lawyers, law and policy makers, economists, evolutionary biologists, urban planners. I mean, this, is, this has been in the works now for about a year and, and, and these interviews have taken place across New York and across Washington, DC. 
but it looks alongside maps, drawings, biological ephemera, and also looking at the topographical landscape of how looking at Godzilla as a real object moving across time and space, destroying a, a city might be looked at from a legal and urban planning perspective. Oh. And I'm gonna end there. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So you're welcome to have questions that follow this. Uh, everybody feel free to use the question and answer button down at the bottom of your screen uh, for any questions for Alona. Thank you so much. This is great work. Um, always really right, there's like birds on I have a very big bug <laughs> sort of like birds like pecking I don't know what's going on today it's uh, <laughs> it's always really exciting to hear about work that's kind of pushing the boundary of where the profession can exist and so I'm, I'm always really excited to hear more about that thank you so much no problem Is there any questions? Uh, so I am just going to speak. Um, the question and answer isn't working for me. So oh, um, okay. I just want to thank you for coming. This is so interesting. And it's always to hear such interesting perspective. And my question is, um, I think what you do is very niche. And it's also very introspective. Um, how did you get into this? Like what pulled you initially to um, this idea? of like, you know, what you're interested in? Um, thank you for um, your question. It's a good one. And it's, there's always an assumption perhaps that this is something to get into, which perhaps is a strange way to put it because perhaps it's not a field, but it comes from, understanding my interest in strategy as a kind of artistic practice. And while I have worked for various companies and governments, for example, and I can't list them on here because it's being recorded about ways in which um, this kind of work can be useful is that it comes from a strategic a strategic way of thinking and also on this and also really a boredom for design in that I find design and architecture in its current in in the current status quo lacking enough complexity to understand the sort of social constraints that architects designers etc come across and not necessarily from a um, intersectionality point of view, but we can talk about that all day at a different time, which it has many, many issues with, but really looking at the sort of the unbearing load that is ignored by design and architecture until it becomes a problem that enters into practice, such as how does urban planning, how is that affected by basic economics or politics or ways in which we mitigate risk, for example, and that yes, these go into strategic ways of looking and thinking, but it never, it rarely, rarely enters the architect's office. And I think it is something to be cognizant of. Um, Stephen Trilby wrote a really great book called Exit Architecture, and he put it in a really interesting way in which he said, you know, the way the ways in which to escape from the building should often be designed before the building itself, which to me is a sort of fascinating idea. Um, and whether this is a profession or not, I'm not sure. It's done me well to maneuver between this ways of thinking, but I, I think it can be ubiquitous in that just being more um, 
reflexive in, in ways of thinking really and that is not a decorative profession uh, such as you know the, the sort of general populace, populace thinks it to be so I don't know whether that answers your question at all um, it's mainly because I'm a huge geek and I'm interested in how geopolitics affects aesthetics yeah no that was so interesting um, to kind of follow up with that, how do you think we can educate people on this problem? Uh, designers and architects need to read a lot more than they do um, as a teacher currently. Um, and reading beyond the confines of architectural theory, design theory, and looking into uh, larger fields that can be understood. Reading about politics, um, critical theory would help. Um, honestly, just being thirstful for curious about how the world works and how the how parts of the world begin to collapse when it doesn't work, or that it works perfectly, which is, for example, capitalism works perfectly. This idea that capitalism doesn't work, no, it works perfectly, which is why we're in the issue, which is why we're in the position we're in because this is business as usual. This is it working perfectly well. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Question in the chat from Jason. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, can you talk some more about some of your inspirations and references? For example, do you appreciate triple O? Are there other theories of object hood that you draw from? Or for that matter, are there any other frameworks outside of legal and cinematic um, that you foreground when thinking about urbanism in cities? So OOO has come up um, quite a few times. It's not, I'm, I'm certainly aware of it. I often don't bring it into presentations that I give. Sometimes I write about it in reference to OOO for, for much more academic journals. But as a framework of... Um, Using, using critical theory as a framework to design, if anyone's ever tried to do that and been successful, I applaud those that have been able to do such a thing. What do I think about it? I, I think it most certainly relates um, to my work. As far as positioning it alongside, oh, 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 I'm not sure. I think there needs to be maybe in a few years when more projects that I've done can sort of be looked over critically and, and back back over um, through others, not not myself. I'm sorry if that didn't didn't answer precisely. I have another question. Um, could you elaborate more on the different versions of object evidences within the robbery project, specifically the politics of those objects and their interactions with other groups? Can that person elaborate on that? Aubrey, you just put it in the chat, I'll read it out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, it's, what, politics of those objects and their interactions with other groups. What do you mean by that? Hi, yes. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned like um, how this project ended up being um, bought by a cinema director, but it was also oh, okay. used in the model law um, at Harvard and just how those interactions happen and how the exhibition kind of outlives its exhibition time. Um, so that's a really, really good question. It's something that I've been struggling with myself for a long time and that thinking that the work leads itself into a particular field or place where I'm thinking, oh great, this is, this is great. I can go into this field and be happy with the trajectory of the work. So the exhibition is never the goal, despite that's how the work is often commissioned. And that it really is, the discussions with or the discourse within other fields that I've always been interested in. So the ways in which, for example, it's used at Harvard and, and most recently or will be at Brown is 
for example, the ways in which mock trials are set up is that there'll be a scenario at which the two opposing sides will investigate or sorry, not investigate, but but defend using a series of facts and artifacts and all of the uh, material constructs that make up a case. So witnesses, uh, depositions, et cetera, et cetera, mostly texts, um, but the various objects in relationship to a crime or a particularly particular kind of defense strategy. So this is presented as a kind of um, fictional scenario at which uh, professors within law schools have taken as a study to look at urban structures and urban planning for robbery, for example. So how do the how how is these complex scenarios unpicked in a court of law? I've been collecting for years um, ways in which large government investigations have happened over certain individuals um, or how the sinking of ships have been investigated by lawyers and governments say 1600s and 1700s and you can buy these kind of um, large journals that document cases so a, a court case will happen over this specific period of time and all the evidence is released at some point to the public based on the nature of the case. So it's more that the ways in which these interactions happen. So just, just sorry, this is a complex question. So to split it into two, the ways in which film began to pick up my work is that during the Lisbon architecture triennale, there was political in unrest happening in Lisbon at the time. Um, and, and Lisbon still in a period of austerity this project was originally funded to go into that triennale, um, but lost its funding at the last minute. Can you imagine, you know, sort of planning for an exhibition for a long time, then suddenly losing its funding? And so friends of mine that I graduated with run this group that put projects on Kickstarter. And this project went on to Kickstarter and it received like, it never received its money, but it received so much press. So it went on, um, various TV channels across the US. I got contacted from Fox, um, Universal Studios, lots of kind of emails asking about where this project was at and what, and what um, was there a breakdown that could be bought, for example. Um, but it also got picked up by, I got an email from the technicians at the FBI saying they're really fascinated in the project. <laughs> and, um, could I, could I come in and speak to them about it? And they're really fascinated by the, this kind of technique of research, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it became this just a complete accidental uh, dissemination between two sides of interest, which is essentially what the project is. I mean, the, the very nature of forensics is both conjecture and fact, and it's sort of split into these two entities, which I'll continue to be my clients and people that I'm interested in talking to. So it's an utter accident. Um, and how does how does one design objects for an exhibition? I'm not sorry for um, court. I'm not sure that's a that's a, a a huge field at which architects are working in, but occasionally that does happen. So I'm certainly open and interested. It is really just putting the work out there and talking enough about it to try and appeal to both groups. It sounds absurd, but it, it, it can work de depending on the situation. Sorry, I'm not very articulate on this. It's, it's complicated, the amounts of places that these things have appeared in. So I think we have one more question. Oh, do you really want to say something? Yeah, I just, uh, this has been really um, enjoyable to, to listen to and um, it has really cast a unique perspective on, you know, the way um, we maneuver through our cities. Do you, do you feel like you see your, the cities that you've spent a lot of time in completely differently um, now that this research has, you know, taken up such a, a large, um, 
amount of your time and energy and interests? So actually, funny you say, I often see them are not anomalies in cities, such as a window in a building that you just think, why on earth would someone design and put a window there in a particular place in a building and often rethink it as maybe a legal requirement? Um, and because I'm not really an architect, so my background is in interaction design and graphic design. Um, looking i think looking at the specific infrastructures and how they collide with one another has become much more of an interest so looking at the anomalies in cities but often how cities flow and how sometimes they don't work but perhaps mainly looking at how um crime is how crime is positioned, but from a, a white collar perspective, actually, um, and looking at, say, for example, skyscrapers as the indicative manifest of white collar crime, but how things work in relationship to structural economics that relate to those kinds of questions. Um, not necessarily segregation, um, but really looking at the possibilities of how cities could be rethought about, particularly in relationship to risk or what a risk city would really look like. The only city I've ever seen that's been built around this idea of risk is Canary Wharf in London, which is a private island that exists in London with its own laws, which is an, another, could be a whole lectures long worth of um, discussion, but it, it, I mean, it certainly makes you think about how objects are can be constructed from the law, for example, from a from a legal perspective. Well, I just find it um, really interesting how you know from your background how um, architecture and urbanism has just seeped into uh, what you what you do and what you look at, and and it has just become a you know commonplace in in the conversations that you're having, um, you know, almost unintentionally, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it often become, it can come, it can become a little bit embarrassing when I'm in a room full of architects. And of course, architecture most certainly maneuvers quite smugly through its own um, vernaculars and design does equally so. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but it often can become a little bit uh, tongue in cheek almost in that I can have conversations about urban infrastructure and not necessarily um, use the rhetoric or analysis that architects tend to use. It, it, it can either go one way, it can either be very hostile or, or it can be very welcoming, which is quite nice when it is welcoming or welcomed. I have one last question from Delaney. Um, we were both really interested in the way you craft your models. Um, they're so clean and the materiality of them is just quite interesting. Um, you could speak a little bit more to like how you choose details and like what what um, what's important versus you know what you choose to spend time with. Um, so um, when I I never ever wanted to design objects, and maybe I, I I sort of come across as like I loathe objects. I think they're important. I teach designed objects, by the way, because I loathe them so much and I think they need a lot of work. Um, and when I first interviewed for a graduate place at the Royal College, I, they were talking to me about objects. And, and for the life of me, I just sort of didn't want to have the conversation. And it was just this bizarre turn of events. But I used to describe objects as a two dimensional drawing that's been extruded, which is totally ridiculous and completely not the case. Um, but I often do drawings. I think draw the majority of my work is drawings and the ways in which the objects are made is simply to simply a necessity to adopt a graphic design way of thinking as a last minute thought of an object. And while I couldn't design a lamp or a chair or a table um, in ways that are necessarily conventional, um, 
the ways in which things are made, I like to consider them to be drawings that have been reconsidered from all angles um, that are often that often come from a very two dimensional place. Like, for example, I in all the architectural models I make, um, I chamfer the edges on every piece of acrylic that's made. It's also everything's cut at 45 degree angles so that it's is able to stand without glue, but mainly so that it uh, can transport well and that whatever exhibition it can go to is essentially taped on the outside and is able to hold its weight when it's put up um, based on the thickness of the acrylic and so on. Um, and the, the, the scale models are often just made in the ways they're either made from a very um, iconographic way of working. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a piece that I didn't talk about today, which I was going to, but it didn't sort of fit in with the narrative of the lecture, which is called The Ascent, which is a giant aeroplane set piece, which was a theater play. Um, based around the future of work, also set in a law firm. Um, but the ways in which I wanted to design it was just a, a scale drawing scaled up as the, as the absolute minimalist way to tell a story is the ways, despite talking about complexity, I think a set, um, the design of a set can sometimes take a, take a back seat to the story itself. That, that doesn't explain um, or answer your question really, but it's mainly coming from graphic design way of working and thinking rather than a sculptural one. I think if it had been a sculpture, things that sculptor things that would have been a lot more messy. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Um, thank you so much for being here. I, I think I speak for all of us when we say this has been extremely fascinating. Um, Everyone else, um, please join us again for our lecture tomorrow with Shelter Collective. Um, what a great way to start the week and we can't wait to continue it. Thanks Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> All right, everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.